All right, so I guess that would have been like the abrupt end of whatever the last part is. And I guess this is now the abrupt start of whatever new part this is. Cause yeah, this boss is gonna take like a little while still. So I'm just gonna keep on rambling while this is going on. So reason happenings with my truck. As I was mentioning earlier this stream, one of the key things that needs to be fixed right now is the brakes. The brakes are a little bit funky. So like it can go, it just can't stop. So that's a little bit of a concern. You probably want a vehicle to be able to successfully stop, you know, that's pretty important. So to fix the brakes, we, oh my good gracious, we would need to get the tires off. So we started trying to get the tires off. And again, apologies if I've ranted about this during near replicate before. I don't think I have, but you know, just in case I have preemptive apologies if I've mentioned it during this series before. But since I'm just gonna be here like holding this button for a while may as well ramble about something So if I'm repeating myself apolo apologies But we shall uh what well, just keep on holding this button here anyway, um The passenger side came off like no problemo like Wasn't much problem at all. I mean the tires on that thing probably haven't come off for Probably close to two decades honestly. I mean, it's not like it's been driven all that much at all for the past two decades um so, well, so we figured it might be a bit rough to get up. No. Okay, it's fine. Um, the passenger side was just fine, but the driver's side was just like darn near impossible. No matter, gosh dang it. No matter how much we just turned and turned and turned, they would not come out. And they weren't like, they weren't like lugs. They're like bolts. They're in vinegar in the other room right now, getting like, you know, the rust off him. I can go grab one and show it. I will be back in like 30 seconds. Wah. These things are what the tires are held on by. More old school kind of stuff. So rather than, you know, the threads being like stuck through that you kind of put the tires onto and you like twist a lug on like you would with modern tires. Nah, it's just a straight up bolt. So you have to like line up the tire perfectly if you're putting it on and then put the bolts in just like that. Also, it's kind of like gross and vinegary right now since, you know, it's getting a rust off of it with like vinegar and stuff. I have some paper towels here. So I'm just gonna like place this on a paper towel for now and wipe off my fingers. That's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, those things, essentially. So pain in the butt, <laughs> essentially, to deal with there. And the driver's side, no matter how much we turned and turned and turned, they just would not come off. To the point that like, as we continue to try, I forgot that the block button was the other bumper for a hot second. Um, and have a good rest of the night then, CJ. I appreciate you stopping by and hanging out. Um, -bop. Um, but yeah, we kept on turning to the point that a couple of them just straight up snapped off. So two of them, we have like the top half of and the, what are you doing, Emil? What are you doing? Um, and the other half of them are stuck in the wheel hub. So we're going to have to like take off the wheel hub, probably take it somewhere so that they can remove those like broken bolts and stuff. It's going to suck. Gosh darn you. Um, but anyway, we found out later the reason why it was so hard to get the driver's side off. Turns out that I guess around like the late 30s, early 40s, some maniac over at uh, over at Dodge was like, you know what we should totally do? We should have the passenger side be threaded normally. So it's righty tighty, lefty loosey but the driver's side be reverse threaded. So it's righty loosey, lefty tighty. So, <laughs> so we were turning it the wrong way and snapped off a couple bolts when we wouldn't have had to do that when, uh, if we had just known to turn it the other way. Um, and at that point we had turned them so much the wrong way that it was a little bit difficult to get them off from there. So we put a torch to it heated it up a little bit and then they were honestly really easy to get off no problemo but then there's the issue of those two snap ones 
but for real like why was that the design choice looking into it apparently it was something to do with them thinking that it would keep the tires on better if they all turned the same way in the in terms of like they all turn like towards the back of the truck you could say like turning the same way in that sense apparently they thought it would like better keep on the tires or something like that it's so silly but apparently that was just like the standard convention from like the early 50s well late 40s early 50s to early 60s they stopped doing it in the early 60s because they realized that it was stupid um but for that narrow range for vehicles at least it was that really wacky system so now that two of those have been snapped off i now need to hunt around for at least two 1950s vehicle reverse threaded bolts and they're not exactly easy to find cheap because they're like such a niche like weird thing you know part of me is almost tempted to just like replace the wheel hubs completely with something more modern and then just never have to deal with this again <laughs> that's what part of me is tempted to do but you know the easier thing for now would just be to uh you know get two bolts out in the world and then figure out something better long term later you know yeah sucks to suck as a is Emil gonna take them all out again? That can be what happens like last time. Well, we might just, we'll see what happens again. We shall see. So I've been browsing around online and I've been seeing a lot of sites actually that do list, you know, 1950s vehicle reverse threaded bolts. Usually in sets of five and they're usually around like 50 bucks USD. And it's like, well, that's a little bit pricey for what it is, but considering, you know, the rarity of it nowadays, like, I guess that's understandable. Like, it's not too bad. And I've wanted to order some, but no matter what site I go to... Yes. Well said there. Okay, boobity bop. Um, but no matter what site I go to, Whenever I go to checkout, it's like, oh yes, yeah, so the final purchase price, like $50 USD. Shipping and importing into Canada fees, another $50. It's like, it's like really, really. Every site I go to, it's always the same. Around $50 for like shipping and importing fees. And it's like, wow, that's pretty ludicrous. When it'd probably just be like a baggie of bolts, you know, nothing all that crazy. So it's like, really? It doesn't really need to be that expensive. So I'm going to try and like look around if there's like any way to buy something like that locally. I don't know if there will be. But yeah, so it is possible that turning the wrong way might wind up being like a hundred dollar mistake. So, you know, that really, really sucks. And I'm <laughs> not exactly too impressed about that. Let's just say not exactly too thrilled with that idea but yeah ow not exactly super thrilled gosh dang it and you know i'm financially stable it's not like i need to worry about you know something like that breaking me i would be working on this project if i needed to worry about that like i can i can pay for what needs to be paid for but it still sucks you know <laughs> that's the thing i'm still a university student was paying for classes and stuff you know so sucks to suck sucks to suck i guess so that's the recent development with the uh with the truck we might get the brakes fixed in the uh in the near future here may have someone who's willing to help out with it i was hoping to get help with my uh, from my smash co commentator for a while but yeah he, uh, he's not returning my calls no i'm not calling but it's probably busy with things i imagine but someone else we may end up getting help from to work on the brakes there and hey Getting the brakes fixed would be pretty cool. I may as well just keep rambling about things because, you know, this is just all this boss is, you know, is, is the case. So the current path to making it legal. When we, like the very beginning of starting this project, it wouldn't start. It would come close. It would come very close to starting because essentially what happened is my grandpa first bought that truck 
and he was planning on restoring it like he had a previous truck that he had restored and he started doing some work on it like he replaced the seats he got it running he got it started like it wouldn't start when he first got it but then he was like you know what i've done this once before and i don't really want to do it again i'm too old to do this at this point i'm just gonna sell it off and that's when it was sold off to my family so it gosh dang it and it had been you know sitting around in our backyard for the past 15 16 years something like that <sighs> something along those lines um so when we were after it had been sitting for so long when we were trying to get started it wouldn't start but it wasn't super far off from like being able to start though like it wasn't like the engine had to be completely rebuilt or anything like that it's not like one of those uh one of those trucks that you know one of those old vehicles that you get and it won't even start and you have to figure out how to even get it going like thankfully just had to do like some basic stuff mostly had to like rebuild the carburetor is what it was there so my uh my dad brought the carburetor to a cousin of his that's adept with those kinds of things and got the carburetor rebuilt so that was solved and then it turned out that the fuel filter was leaking and uh i have the old fuel filter here right now i recently brought it inside so i can show it so like old school fuel filters well i just put it in the box of like the newer fuel filter that i bought but old school fuel filters are gonna be looking like that so like this worked just fine if it wasn't for the fact that one of the insides here is a little bit stripped with age and it was spluttering fuel so it worked but it was a fire hazard so like use that fuel filter if you want your vehicle to explode i guess i don't know um so we couldn't use that so and i don't know where to find an old school fuel filter like that so i just got like a freaking 20 dollar like modern one from napa was the case just for the sake of like getting it going without it being a fire hazard but you know it's set up in such a way that if i ever find like an old school fuel filter out in the world i can just buy it and just you know slap it in and like no problemo and then it's like more close to original in that case you know so you know there's something a lot more modern there right now it's like a cheap alternative but you know doesn't necessarily have to be that way it can be swapped out at whatever point i don't know where you'd find something like that though is the case but anyway um so the things that needed to be done to get it legal are, um, you know, get it running, which we did there, which was largely done by my grandpa like a decade and a half ago. Um, need to replace the windows because the windows are cracked. Luckily, the side windows are fine. It's just the uh, front window and the rear view, especially the rear view. The rear view is completely shattered, which is funny because, you know, when it first went into this little tent garage in the backyard, it was completely fine. It just completely shattered one winter because there's some glass I couldn't deal with elements all that well so we're gonna have to like get some glass custom made from crystal glass considering you know windows like that aren't made anymore in that shape for vehicles like that anymore considering that was 70 years ago um we're so gonna have to replace the windows gotta fix up the wiper motor and maybe it already works uh, we uh my little cousin and I actually installed the wiper motor the last time that I was over there and working on it so we got it set up but there's no fuel in it right now so we won't know whether it actually works until like we put some fuel in it fire it up and test out whether the wiper motor works because turns out even if it's not raining apparently you need windshield wipers to be functional to be legal to drive so so yeah wiper motor is installed maybe that'll uh maybe it works maybe it doesn't we'll see <laughs> hopefully it works i'll be really upset if it doesn't work um near replace the brakes as i mentioned before near replace the tires tires are like pretty sad and old and probably not gonna get the job done anymore so like the tires are just you know in this backyard tent garage thing for bob right now <laughs> is the case and next time that i go to a family gathering to my dad's side of the family which is at like another town that's not the city that i live in i have a cousin who works at a cal tire place whenever we go out there for some family gathering i'll just bring my tires along and get them sized up for something of like equivalent size something cheap of equivalent size that we can just slap on there is the plan and then we can get tires on it which will be good um i'm going to need to put in a rear view mirror there's no rear view mirror on that thing like i don't know if it was like before the time of rear view mirrors or something like that or what the heck is going on there but yeah there's no rear view mirror on the thing so i'm gonna have to go out and see about picking up a rear view mirror at some point and installing that will be the case and then i think we just need to get it like appraised licensed registered 
and then I think it'd be good to go. I think it'd be legally drivable. I think it'd be worthy to hit the road. It would be far from fully restored. There would still be a lot of stuff that would need to be done on it to get it fully restored. Like a lot of body work. We need to completely replace the box. Give it like a new paint job, stuff like that. But, you know, the stuff to get it legal to drive at least is manageable enough that we should be able to get it done like before the snow melts. I mean, the snow's not even on the ground yet. But pretty soon there will probably start being some snow on the ground around here sometime into October. By the time the snow melts, it should be legal to drive. And I want to start driving it to get practice. Because I can drive as automatic just fine. But standard, I'm still very new to. So, like, I'm learning a little bit here and there with my cousin. <laughs> is, the, is the thing. I stalled his car a lot in practice. So, practicing with him and his car first. Practicing with the modern standard first. Before I go to, like, hard mode with the old school standard with that thing. It's a uh, three on the tree, it's called. So like the gear shift is just to the right of the wheel and you have to twist it like up, down and all around and all crazily and stuff. So that'll be interesting there. So I hope next summer, if it's legal to drive, that, you know, my main vehicle to go places will still be like, you know, my car, my main vehicle, stuff like that. But if I'm just going on short trips on routes that I'm comfortable with or routes I'm on regularly, like if I'm going to Taekwondo or something like that, I want to start driving that just to like build up practice and build experience, you know, so I can get comfortable driving something like that, you know. That was my plan. That was my plan there. So we shall see how that goes. There's, as I mentioned before, there's no tires on it right now. So the thing is just like off the ground. It's on four jack stands. It's in a little bit of a sorry state right now. It's a little bit saddening to see it like that, but at the same time, it's awesome because like, yes, progress. Things are happening, you know? So that's cool there. But yeah, so right now the big things I need to be on the lookout, look for out in the world are a rear view mirror, bolts, and uh, maybe a fuel filter, but that's not, that's not too important since there's one that works in there right now anyway. Oh, and one more thing. We need to make sure that the brake and signal lights work, which maybe they already do. They might already work. Not 100% certain. We'll have to fire it up and like test it out along with the wiper motor. So we might not have to worry about replacing the uh, brake and signal lights. Because maybe it's fine already. We shall see. We shall see when next we test it out. When it was first manufactured, this was before the time that signal lights were required. But thankfully, the previous owner did install signal lights onto it. So hopefully they work still. Open up! All right, time to go behind then. Oh yeah, so that's the uh, that's the case on that. That's what's currently going on there. Yeah, I'm going around the back. Yeah, that's what I'm going to go do. That's my plan here. Oh, I almost jumped off the edge. That would have been really embarrassing right there. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the to-do list there. That's what's going on on that front. Wait. Oh, I need to go up more. I need to go up more. Oh, hi, Kaine. Yeah, I am. I'm doing the thing. So, yeah. It's a little bit embarrassing that I own a vehicle that I've literally never driven. And I'm probably not yet capable of driving. I'm going to need like more practice before doing so. But, you know, slow and steady road. Getting there. One thing at a time. Get the practice in and make the vehicle itself legal to drive. Bit by bit will be the case. So it'll be interesting to see how that project continues to unfold. We'll be intermissing there. Many, many pew pew pews. Are, are no. <laughs> um, what else can I ramble talk about while I literally hold down this one button? I don't know. I don't know, not a whole lot going on lately that's super duper interesting, per se. 
not the whole lot. I mentioned it before, and I can mention it again, that when Nier Automata comes out on the Switch, I won't be able to play it, like, right when it comes out, because I don't think I'll have this beaten yet. Like, maybe if I'm able to put in some good time, maybe I'll be able to beat this before that point. But even if I do, like, it'll still take a little bit longer for all the uploads to go up for, uh... The uh, uploads for this series will probably go into Nier Automata on the Switch's release a decent bit. Most likely is the case, so yeah, I'm not gonna be playing Automata on the Switch like right when it comes out, but probably shortly-ish after. Probably. Yeah, you just hang in there, Emil. Unless my game schedule gets like so randomly packed out of nowhere with other things, like for some reason. But hopefully it won't. <laughs> I don't imagine why it would. Should be A-OK. -okay. Should be A-O fine on that up front. I had some time earlier today, so I actually started designing, like, thumbnails for upcoming, uh, upcoming series. Sometimes it's doing damage to you, sometimes it's not. So dang weird. Should I be doing the Dark Blast? Would it be, uh, would it be a little bit faster? Not Dark Blast, um, what the heck? Dark Lance, that's what I meant. Um, like, for example, earlier today, I threw together part one thumbnails and like the thumbnail projects for four different upcoming playthroughs is the case so like i have a thumbnail format for near automata now is the case so you know when we get around to covering it i'll be at the ready and stuff so there's that there's that right there apparently the switch version is called the end of yorha edition so apparently there was like the original Nier Automata and then they released like Game of the Yorha edition as their way of saying Game of the Year. But the Switch version that's coming out is specifically called the End of Yorha edition, whatever that means. Um, it was hard to get this to stand out on like the white background. So I took the gear from Nier here and put it behind the number there. And then it got me thinking like, should I do that for like Nier Replicant? Because there's like a symbol over the eye for Nier Replicant as well. But it's like, eh. Probably won't bother at this point. Yeah, so excited for Fire Emblem Engage. The UI and battle camera look like the 3DS Fire Emblem. Will you love it? The UI and battle camera look like uh, the Ike games is what they look like to me. So. So if I like. Would this do more damage? I don't know. I don't know. Would it be maybe? I'm working on it. I'm working on it here. Hey, I'm I'm walking here. Anyway, yeah, I'm looking forward to Fire Emblem Gage as well. This is the case. Should hopefully be a good fun time. Oh, think about Fire Emblem. I don't think I've told this story on stream yet. Now that I think about it, and this is semi-recent. I do have another story that I can tell that sort of relates to Fire Emblem. So, last year, there was this game that came out that like regulars around the channel may be familiar with like I know more as you're definitely familiar with it Dark Deity that game released and sometimes I'll have like some game developers or publishers reach out to me and be like hey would you be interested in covering like X game for free like because you know I'm not that large of a creator yet where I have like a whole lot th to offer like me covering X game isn't gonna bring you know a massive ton of traffic to a game by any means so you know I'm not yet at the point where I'd exactly, ah, I'd exactly be getting any sponsorship deals or anything like that. But sometimes I have, you know, people who reach out to me that are like, hey, if you're interested in covering this for free, we'd be glad to give you, you know, a key for it, you know, and give you like some before release information and stuff like that. So I usually don't accept stuff like that unless it's something that actually genuinely looks really interesting to me. And that's the way that Dark Deity was because Dark Deity was very inspired by Fire Emblem. It was essentially like a Fire Emblem fan game kind of thing. And I was like, huh, I love Fire Emblem. This looks pretty cool. So I was pretty intrigued. So the publisher who had reached out to me, a representative of the publisher that had reached out to me, Freedom, I was like, yeah, I'm undecided, but I'm definitely intrigued. I'll definitely think about it here. Um, and they were like, okay, cool. Would you like to meet the director? I was like, um, huh? Don't tell me I lose. 
Are you actually kidding me? Um... I did it before. Hopefully it doesn't have, like, more health this time. Can I assign, like, more damage to Dark Blast or something? Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa wait. Whoa, 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 wait. Um, Dark Blast. I have magic power up 10% and the Drain HP thing, Bob. Magic power up 30%. Yeah, that's probably going to be what I want there. And then... Hmm. These are the things that's changing. MP cost, EXP rate, aim drop rate, paralyze level one. Guess I can leave like the slight drain HP thing or Bob. I don't know. Or XP rate. But yeah. This is your high millennia blade of Mikula. Yeah, that. There. Well, I buffed up Dark Blast a little bit, I guess. All right. I'll try to be on top of this in that case. Anyway, um, so I met the uh, director for that chip and he, uh, he's a cool, chill guy. Really vibed with him there. We had some good laughs and we're able to talk about, you know, a lot of Fire Emblem related stuff. Was a, was a good time. And when the game came out, Freedom had told me that they were going to give me a key to the game. And, you know, they said that they were going to give me the key after it was revealed at E3, after they do like the trailer thing Rebob, that they were doing at E3. What they didn't tell me was that the reveal that they were doing for the game at E3 was also going to be where they launched the game, like right on the spot. Like it was happening right then and there. So I was planning on covering the game right when it came out and it was a surprise that it was coming out right at that moment. So I was like, oh, I'll cover it now then. So I waited for a little while to get like my emailed key from freedom and it just wasn't happening for a while so i was like oh like I'll, I'll probably wind up getting it later i'll just buy the game normally for now and that uh in that case and when they give me the key later i'll just you know i'll give it to someone else is my plan so i bought the game and i wound up doing my full playthrough and i uh i never actually got a key from freedom they had a Discord server made specifically for E3. Yeah, you speed ran it, but you know, speed running the game. I now know somebody who speed run it more. <laughs> is the uh, is the case? I uh, yeah, I know someone who speed ran it faster now. Is the way that this story is eventually gonna lead to. Um, but anyway, I didn't get my uh, key there. Freedom had created a Discord server. Spe like, what is the hitbox here? Sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. Um, here it seems to be damaging you maybe this is the sweet spot angle or something i don't know um they created a discord server specifically for e3 to like connect you know the uh developers and people representing the publisher to the various content creators and i inquired in that discord server that they made like hey i never actually got my key like what's going on with a uh, What's going on with that? And I wasn't the only one, considering some other content creators and journalists and stuff like that were mentioning the same. So I thought that we would get, you know, an answer to this. And then instead, shortly after, they took down the Discord server that they had made for E3. So it was like, huh, well, I guess I'm not getting my key. That, uh, that kind of sucks. And maybe I should have reached out more directly to Freedom about that afterwards, but I just kind of <laughs> didn't there. And I probably should have told the director that that was the case. Just like, hey, you're a publisher kind of owes me a copy of your game that they didn't deliver. So kind of a dick move on my part, not telling him. So whoops, that was a, that was a mistake there. Um, but anyway, I just kind of left it untouched for a long time. And then recently, and by recently, I mean like last week, I had Freedom reach out to me again and they were just like, hey, like we know that you've done some stuff for us before. We just want to let you know that there is this offer on the table where if you want to cover any of the games that we've published, just say so and we'll give you a key. And if you cover like any games than any videos you do on our games, we'll give you like a 10% extra revenue, like on top of what YouTube is giving you in terms of advertising revenue. So if you want to cover any of our games, you can just have them. 
like that and we'll give you like a slight little smidge extra to your revenue so like it's honestly a smart way to handle like the uh marketing of something like that because again like i as a small creator don't have like a massive ton to offer in terms of you know directing a lot of traffic towards you know video games or anything like that so but they do a system that you know can be Alrighty, beneficial well to both parties for those that are interested in that kind of thing like any content creators that are like really into indie games and want to play stuff like that that'd be a really good deal for them if they were planning on covering like a bunch of indie games anyway i told them that like you know i have like too much stuff going on in my schedule right now but i appreciate you bringing this to my attention and i'll keep it in mind and i inquired about like some details with it so you know if i ever uh, if i ever do consider doing that it wouldn't be for a while you know it's not like it's not like it's such a crazy offer that i have to i absolutely have to take it like whoa i get like a few bucks for my playthroughs when it comes to youtube revenue so it wouldn't be anything super significant there to have 10 percent ad on top of but in case i'm ever feeling spicy wants some other games to play i guess i have the option to just like request it of them and uh you know get the key for that so that's pretty neat so i was like yeah appreciate bringing this to my attention i'll consider it in the future but can't really consider it right now but and then i go into the uh, details of you know this situation from like a year ago by the way there was this time like a year ago with dark deity i was like first of all here's the stuff that i've done with dark deity and i listed and i linked like the playlist that i did i was like yeah i did this full thing on dark deity and here's the situation i was told that i was gonna get a key but i didn't and i inquired in that discord server and then the discord server was deleted and i never actually got the key that i was promised so you know i got a really good impression of you know the director of the game chip and the game that he was making you know got a really good impression of them but i didn't really get that great of an impression from his publisher freedom so when i mentioned that to the person who had emailed me she was like well dang really sorry to hear about that experience i'll, I'll be sure to request a key for you right away and within 10 minutes she gave me a key to dark deity and i was like oh well that's <laughs> thanks i appreciate it so you know a year later i finally got my uh, officially freedom provided dark deity key <laughs> i finally got it <laughs> was the case you know it doesn't really make any difference to me at this point since i've owned the game myself for a year now but you know i did appreciate that you know they realized that that was something that went on and we're like hey sorry about that here here's the thing that we promised that we'd give you really sorry that that situation came up so you know I definitely uh good on them for you know correcting correcting that situation like right away like she responds to my email being like oh yeah i'll request you a key and then like within 10 minutes there was another email response being like yeah here's your key there it is i was like wow thank you um but because i've already owned the game myself for like the past you know year i needed to give the key to someone else so i reached out to carvia and I was like, hey, Carvia, you, uh, do you want a game similar to Fire Emblem to play before the release of Fire Emblem Rainbow while you're waiting for that? Because I got my official, like, freedom given Dark Deity key. But, like, I can't use it. I already own the game, you know, <laughs> is the, uh, is the case. And he was like, sure, I appreciate it. So I gave him my, uh, my freedom key for Dark Deity. The day later, he freaking sends me a message on discord saying oh thanks for the key again harmonia as he posts as he sends me an image of like the end credits i was like are you kidding me you beat it within a day and he was like yeah <laughs> i did had fun <laughs> was a good time so he uh, he enjoyed the game apparently beat it in one session and as i was talking with him a bit later i later found out that like after i had given it to him during the day he didn't play it like right on the spot but during the night he had trouble sleeping and he got up at like 3 a.m and he decided to start playing dark deity at uh, 3 a.m and he played it for 11 hours and beat it at like you know early afternoon <laughs> essentially on that uh on that day after waking up at 3 a.m not being able to get to sleep and just playing dark deity for 11 hours straight and beating it in one sitting so <laughs> so there was that so i decided to reach out to chip about this i decided to reach out to dark deity's director about my tall tale so i was like hey i have a tall tale for you that you might find interesting that i probably should have shared with you sooner so i explained the whole situation about how like 
you know, Freedom had promised me a key that they hadn't delivered on and wow, I just bought the game normally and that stuff there. Um, and then I was reached out to like last week and you know, I finally got my key and then I gave it to my pal and he speed ran it there. And uh, you know, he appreciated me bringing that to his attention. He was saying like, you know, to be, to be fair, it was their first time like putting something out there apparently. It was saying first time handling something like that and working with content creators. So apparently the people from Freedom were like pretty new at stuff like that. But yeah, I said like, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. But yeah, that, uh, he said that that was super disappointing to hear that that was something that had gone on in the first place. And I was like, yeah, I probably should have brought that to your attention like way sooner. Like, that's probably something that's pretty important to know about. So I was like, whoops, sorry about that. But yeah, told the whole story and uh, he was saying like, yeah, appreciate you bringing it to to my attention. And, you know, glad to hear that you and your friendo were able to enjoy it and have fun and appreciate you both supporting the game and stuff. You know, being like super awesome, wholesome self. We've seen this cutscene before, so like I'll talk over it, I guess. <laughs> we saw it during playthrough one. He goes all super saiyan and he like deletes that does control alt delete um and when i brought that up to carvia and saying what uh what chip was saying there carvia was like yes i did have fun i beat it in one sitting i was like wait one sitting and that's when i found out the thing about about 3 a.m <laughs> so he shared that with me oh so slightly different because we get to hear the shade speaking but that might be the one difference i guess um so I took a screenshot of my conversation with Carvia, him saying that he beat it in like one sitting after getting up at 3 a.m. And I just sent it to Chip, being like, oh, yes, the the plot thickens. And <laughs> Chip just responded saying, what a fucking king, legend. So, <laughs> so there was that. Anyway, that's the... Uh, that's a tall tale. Anyway, I like Chip. <laughs> He's a cool guy. <laughs> Next sands. Uncontrollable magic. We're gonna have like reading stuff going on. Except this is gonna be for a meal this time, I think. I have to protect the people I love. That was my only thought as I unleashed a magic powerful enough to destroy not only the shade, but everyone else as well. All of them. So many innocent lives. Destroy. Viscerate. Crush. Kill. These are the dark impulses that overwrite all other thoughts. As a being that was created to be a magical weapon, these are my instincts. Or maybe it's better to call them our instincts. Wheels Dream Rampage. So this was something way back when he was being turned into a experimental weapon. A klaxon sounds from deep within the bowels of the laboratory. Thick metal shutters drop down, sealing off the room with a series of dull metal thuds. Aboard the experiment! Number six is out of control. Everyone get out of here now! Get out of here! The researcher's words are abruptly cut off as a massive hand materializes out of the gloom and lifts him high into the air. The researcher begins to scream. He screams and screams, the sound echoing off the walls of the laboratory until the hand squeezes down coating the room in a deep crimson hue. The rest of his colleagues stand in silence, mouths open, unable to process what they have just seen. Then a female scientist takes a step back and lets fly with a heartbreaking wail. But this is a terrible mistake, for the sound of her cry suddenly brings forth a monster in all of its terrible glory. Its body is a bloated corpse, its head a grinning skull. And it is massive, many times the size of a human. The head lolls from side to side as it tromps about the room on all fours, bringing to mind the wild maneuverings of some wretched, starving beast. This creature, this thing, is experimental weapon number six, also known as Halua. Oh, no. Oh, no. Please stop. Oh, God, save me. Save me. I don't want to die. One by one, 
The maddened cries of the researchers are silenced. If number six understands their per petitions, pays them no heed, instead continuing its rampage of destruction and slaughter with a focus that borders on obsession. After an eternity, the screaming stops. The alarms fall silent. And only then does the creature make a sound, howling out with an unfathomable roar that echoes up and down the empty halls of the blood-soaked laboratory. It's a sound that curses those who have dared bring such evil into the world. And yet, one that also seems to be pleading for help. Two sets of footsteps echo in an otherwise silent corridor in the first level of the laboratory. One set belongs to a young boy, his eyes blindfolded and his hands restrained. The other belongs to a severe man in a long white coat. The man drags the boy along by means of a long chain attached to a set of shackles on his wrists. Rubble is scattered here and there across the floor of the corridor, making the journey an exceedingly difficult one for a boy who cannot see. Um, excuse me, could you please walk a bit slower, sir? I'm not used to being blindfolded and... Rather than stopping, the man only increases his pace, causing the boy to stumble in an attempt to keep up. I pressed A. I heard- yeah, I even heard the sound of me pressing A, but it did- oh. Well, now it's going. This last humiliation proves too much. The boy finds himself unable to arrest his fall. Without the ability to brace himself, he topples to the floor, smashing his head on a pile of debris and causing a trickle of blood to worm its way down his pale, frightened face. Agonized by the pain, the boy inadvertently opens his eyes, causing the falling drops of blood to emit a strange crackling sound before transforming into tiny white rocks. Close your damn eyes, roasts the man. Yes, sir, stammers the boy as he slams his lids shut. He hadn't realized the blindfold had slipped off during the fall, but now he keeps his eyes squeezed shut so tightly that sparkles appear against the black of his vision. The boy is a meal, also known as number seven. Number seven, Burger King. He is a magical weapon whose eyes are capable of turning to stone anything that falls under their gaze. Don't look at me, barks the man. Never look at me. I'm sorry, sir. I'm looking at the ground now, so if you just hand me the blind... Instead of waiting for him to finish, the man extends one foot and presses Emil's face to the floor with a heavy black boot. Sir, stop. You're hurting me. I told you to keep your eyes and your mouth shut, so do it. The man knows this boy, this weapon could wipe him out with a single glance, and yet subduing him in this way gives him a sense of relief. After making certain the boy is sufficiently ca cooed, cowed, I have no idea, the man leans down, retrieves the blindfold, and knots it tightly around the boy's quivering head. Right then, on your feet, let's move. Emil staggers to his feet, trying to ignore the red liquid oozing down his face. The blood doesn't matter, pain doesn't matter. All that matters is finishing the job they had set out for him to do. The second level of the laboratory is in even worse shape than the first. The environs are littered with rubble and rock, making the thought of a decent foothold laughable. When the man's eyes linger on a section of rubble stained a deep red, he has a sudden image of warm, gooey brownies slathered in a strawberry sauce. His stomach lurches at the thought, but when he attempts to avert his eyes, they land on the remains of a human being rendered into what could only be described as paste. The man blinks. His mind goes strangely blank before attempting to determine exactly how many humans had to be sacrificed to create the scattered piles of flesh around him. After a moment, his thoughts simply cease altogether, as if his mind realizes that trying to put such a thing into form is folly. You can go the rest of the way on your own, says the man in a voice much weaker than he wishes it to be. I mean, what does it matter? You're not even human. You're a monster. With this, the man spins around and dashes back down the hall. A helpless Emil simply listens as the footsteps of his erstwhile captor fade into the distance. Emil finds himself alone in a room with a stench of death and blood. For a moment, he considers opening his eyes, but the thought of the horrors that await him squash his plan. Instead, he stands still and listens intently. Eventually, 
The far-off sound reaches his ears. That's the howl I heard before. Emil resumes walking, using the sound of the distant voice to guide him, almost as if willing to call him home. By the time Emil reaches the third level, he is moving on memory as much as sound. His hands and face are covered in fresh wounds from numerous falls, but every time he thinks about giving up, his mind returns to his sister. We studied together. We ate cookies together. We cried together. We laughed together. And sometimes, I was the only one who got yelled at. That's why I was never lonely. Our being together allowed me to stay strong. For Emil, his sister was all he had to live for. So, holding that feeling close to his chest, he presses on, one slow step after the other. Finally, Emil finds himself drawing close to a certain experimental chamber in the deepest part of the laboratory. The howl is very close now. As he touches the switch that controls the door, he thinks about his mission. Number six is the ultimate weapon. She is his sister, and he must turn her to stone. The door slowly opens, revealing the massive interior of the experimentation chamber. After a few steps, Emil removes his blindfold and slowly opens his eyes. His sister lurks before him, but she looks nothing like the girl he once knew. Instead, he sees a savage beast crawling on all fours through the shredded remains of researchers. As the thing that had been his sister stops and tilts his head in Emil's direction, he focuses his gaze on it. A series of soft crunching sounds emerge from the creature as his magic does its terrible work. First the fingers, then the hands, arms, legs, head. What little color the beast once possessed fades to a dull, ashen gray. And yet, somehow, it summons what strength remains and pulls itself toward a meal, one slow, lumbering effort at the time. Wailing, the massive monstrosity closes in. Is she worried about me? Or is she coming to kill me? Emil feels prepared to accept either outcome. After all, this was his older sister, the person he loved more than anyone else in the world. Halua, I... The moment Emil speaks, number six comes to a sudden halt. Silence descends on the chamber as the siblings stare at each other. I'm sorry, Halua, but everyone says you're too powerful. They say it's too dangerous unless I seal you away. I'm so sorry. As Emil watches her body begin to turn to stone once more, number six simply waits in utter, perfect silence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My goodness, everything's white now. <laughs> you can see on my camera, like, how much more it's illuminated me having a white monitor in front of me. The moment number six's petrification is complete, her memories flood into Emil's mind, the two of them huddling together in the cold, all alone in the world, with no one to protect them. All she wanted was to save her little brother, and yet, it was that little brother who, in a sense, saved her. The moment the petrification is complete, Emil sinks to his knees, a frozen sister and a little brother racked with sin. Alone in this cold cage, the two of them weep in a single, silent voice. It was our combined power that destroyed the Airy. Whole existences, entire lives, even their memories. We took it all. We took everything. My sweet, gentle sister turned into a monster. The same thing will happen to me, now that I have her power. If my instincts as a weapon win out and destroy me in the process. If that power ends up hurting someone I love, I...
It's all right. Obtain a fragment, obtain the sacrifice key fragment. We had best be off. Yeah. Well, dang. I guess we get a bit of backstory both for Kaine and Emil in this route when things pertain to them. All right. Understand a little bit more of his feelings there. Oh, hi. Yeah, the doogie's pretty, pretty sleepy over here and pretty relaxed. That's probably a pretty good place to call it for this, uh, uh for this stream. Big stretch. Wah. Most likely. So, can I check how many fragments I have? We have three now, right? We got the one at the, uh, the Lost Woods. I got the one for killing a robot. We got the sacrifice one, right? So, there's two more? Or maybe there's one more and I got another one and I forgot. Because we, did we start out with one? I don't remember. We have one or two more. So, you know, we can probably do that without taking too, too long, I would imagine. And then, uh, and then we can, you know, go beat the Shadow Lord again and get some extra context. So we can probably beat playthrough two next stream. I was honestly about to wrap it up with that mailbox, but we're probably going to get like a prompt that's like, oh, who are we going to go see anyway? So like, I may as well go and save at the main town and then wrap it up. Rather than saving here and wrap it up, so I think I'm gonna do that. found some information about the Shadow Lord. Yeah. Let's drop by the village. Very well. Let's drop by the village. Let's do exactly that. All right. Yeah. So I'm glad that subsequent playthroughs aren't gonna take like as long as the initial playthrough, at least. Thank goodness for that. Like, if you know where you're going, you can somewhat speed-ish through the uh. Subsequent thing where Bob's maybe But yeah So rather than being like a massive multi stream thing where Bob to get to the end like with playthrough one This is just gonna be like a What two streams for playthrough two? Did we do a smidge of playthrough two last time? We did like the first smidge, right? Yeah, so it'll be like three streams for playthrough two It'll be the case Okay, so still a decent smidge of time Yoink giant egg my life is complete now. All right, sweet. I'm intrigued to see how this plays out. I am thoroughly intrigued. So I guess next time we'll get the other pieces of that key. We'll go see what the heck the Shadow Lord has to say. What the heck is going on over there? Now that we'll be able to understand him. Oh, I can hold down a button apparently. Interesting. Oh yeah, we'll find out next time. Next time, we will find things out. So with that, thanks all who stopped by and hung out for another session of shenanigans. Looking forward to seeing what the rest of this journey has to hold. And looking forward to Nier Automata. Really see on the Switch here pretty soon. We shall see how these things go. But for now, until next time, take care and see ya.